Okay, um, the first assignment is a little outmoded now because it talks about Yucca Mountain, but the, uh, the topical areas uh, still make perfect sense. Um, the other thing uh, which Jihao has just added onto the course website is since last time we met, um, if you look at the resource page for this class, this thing here is his notes on how to do the assignment. And so it's kind of a self-interest thing for him because he will see less of you, not that he wants to see less of you, uh, than he would do if you didn't have this on here. But So these, these are a guide to do that. And actually the other thing here is there's also, a, I haven't looked at this for a long time, but this is a YouTube discussion on exactly what to do. The assignment. There you go. Starting up. <laughs> Don't need to hear it today. And so that's, uh, that's available and that's live. Okay. So to do that, uh, the material that perhaps would be useful to you is just this refresher basically on what is present in um, 452, uh, discussion of, I guess we're fine, of Darcy's Law. You should all know what Darcy's Law is. It says that volumetric flow rate is a function of a cross-sectional area of flow. And so if you look at just a, um, a sample that has flow coming out at some volumetric flow rate due to some head gradient, dh, dx. So these are all the terms that exist in this expression, this and this. The rate at which flow occurs is controlled by the hydraulic conductivity. In this class, we'll always use uppercase K for hydraulic conductivity, and we'll always use lowercase K for permeability. Sometimes they're used in interchangeably. This term actually is officially known as the coefficient of permeability. but it's not the permeability per se. They have different units. Length squared which seems like a strange unit, but this length actually scales with the size of the pore, the diameter of the pore, as it turns out. And this length over time is a velocity. It's the velocity at which the, the water would move through the system under a unit head. This is hydraulic head, which is equal to um, the pressure head, pressure divided by unit weight plus the elevation. Of that point. So in other words, it would be in the Bernoulli sense, you've seen this stuff before, right? This is the elevation relative to some datum, and this would be the height of water above this, which is the pressure head. And so that is what drives uh, flow through these systems. Um, and the other terms are, this is dynamic viscosity, this is the density of the liquid, and this is gravitational acceleration. And so we can always move between perme permeability and hydraulic conductivity by knowing this relationship. Uh, the important thing to realize, I guess, is that permeability is a function of the material alone. So a rock, a sandstone, has a permeability of 10 to the minus 15 meters squared, a milli, dar a, a milli darcy, uh, as it turns out, and it's independent of whether a gas is flowing through it, or water is flowing through it, or oil is flowing through it, but the hydraulic conductivity of that rock is dependent on what the fluid is that goes through it. And so typically permeability is used in petroleum engineering and geothermal engineering. Hydraulic conductivities are typically used in soil science and groundwater hydrology, which is what we're talking about. And, and we'll use them interchangeably. So you should uh, be able to, to make that change between them. This is in units of a volumetric flow rate. So this is uh, meters cubed per second, for instance. If you divide both sides by the cross-sectional area of flow, then you end up with this expression here. And this is what we'll refer to as the Darcy velocity. And it's the bulk velocity of the fluid as it goes through the system. And it's just given by the hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the gradient. You increase the gradient, 
it goes faster through it. The actual velocity that it goes through, uh, which we'll call the advective velocity, is the Darcy velocity divided through by porosity, which we'll define today, but it's equal to the volume of the voids, the void space in a rock, divided by the total volume. And so if you think about looking at this cross-sectional area, let's, let me draw it as a circle. If you think about the cross-sectional area of this core, and you think about it being comprised of a bunch of grains which are red and some pore space which is blue then this would equal to the blue region divided by the blue region plus the red region I guess I'm not even speaking in words these days. So, so the total obviously would be the red and the blue together. The void would be just the blue on its own. And really what that's saying is that if you're squeezing all this volumetric flow through this small pipe, which is really only the cross-sectional area of the blue stuff, then it moves much faster than if it was going across the whole section. And so this advective velocity is the same as you driving a car between two traffic lights in a block, the amount of time it takes to get there is driven by that velocity. So the, the time it takes for the water particle to end up at the compliance point is given by this advective velocity. And that's an intrinsic part of the assignment that you'll do for looking at canisters breaking open at Yucca Mountain, stuff being carried downstream, and arriving at a compliance point 40 kilometers downstream at uh, Long Street, Nevada. So you need to know that. So if we know the velocity at which fluid flows, then we can certainly get the from that the magnitude of the time it takes to get there by knowing that the velocity is equal to length over time. If we rearrange this, the time taken is just going to be the length traveled divided by the velocity. And if in this simple example it travels a kilometer and it's traveling at a velocity of a hundredth of a kilometer per year, then it takes a hundred years to go from upstream to downstream. Okay? So it's very straightforward. And so if that was the case, if you are sitting at this location here, waiting for it to arrive, and measuring the concentration of the stuff that comes to you, then at year zero, when you start off with this upstream, it would only have got this far, and so there'd be no concentration downstream. After 50 years, I guess it would have gone halfway, but the concentration to you would still be zero until this plume had worked all its way through, and then there'd be a step change in concentration, and it would go up to the upstream concentration, whatever that is. And so the question that you're going to do is what happens if you have an aquifer which is carrying stuff downstream like this? What does the residence time distribution look like? Time distri distribution. the RTD curve, both for a very simple system like this, but maybe where you have material that has different permeabilities in it that are stacked either in series or in parallel. And so you'll see from the question. But this is basically what you need to be able to do that. So we're cutting you a break by, by just mentioning that to you. All right? Okay? And Jiha will be the expert on that if you need to find him. And his address is... What is it, 220? What's your office address, Jihao? 217. 217? So it's on the syllabus. So. All right, so showtime then for what we'll talk about uh, today. We made the point before um, that we were interested in how these non aqueous phase liquids will flow through the subsurface for the first couple of months until they reach some equilibrium location. And then they sit there and then can dissolve and be transported by dissolution downstream and cause a plume. But the first part of what we're dealing with is how this initial two-month period uh, evolves and what the distribution of that fluid would look like. And so what we'll talk about today 
is basically, whoops, um, if you have admissible transport where it doesn't mix, the fluids stay separate, water stays separate from the gasoline. How it's controlled by interfacial behavior which is important. And that interfacial behavior is between the water and the oil, but also the water and the solid and the oil and solid and all permutations of that. And those could be on surfaces of grains, which might be important, or on the shapes of those grains, which might not be just flat substrates like um, uh, microscope plates. And so we'll talk about the geometry of the subsurface. And then we'll develop some very simple models, a single model capillary tube, which is no different from a capillary dipped in water and looking at the height rise in it. And also, if we look at it in slightly different geometries, to be able to say basically what is the distribution of that non-aqueous fluid as it flows into the subsurface and gets captured by sticking to the grains and also gets buoyed by the water that's present within the system. So that's kind of what we'll, we'll attempt to, to, to deal with. We'll come back to these figures that represent these two behaviors. We said one is the case where it's lighter than uh, water, in which case anything that goes into the surface will sink down to the unsaturated zone. When it hits the groundwater table, or actually where it hits the, the Vado zone, it will get buoyed by it. And so what will happen is this stuff will go down here, and it will puddle at the bottom. And the puddle will basically be some form of a, a lens, which looks like this. It sinks because it's denser than air, and it goes through the air-saturated part. But it's less dense than water, so it can't go through the water-saturated part. It will leave a smear of material as it goes through here. This smear will be able to vaporize, just if it gets warm enough to do that. It'll evaporate. And the stuff that sits here, which is almost not 100% saturated with this gasoline, but maybe 80% saturated because there's some water in the system, is then able to just dissolve into this part here. And as we said last time, it'll get carried downstream to cause a plume that progressively, as time goes on, goes further and further out. And we know that the flow velocity of the groundwater flow has to be in this direction because we know that from Darcy's law, this gradient dh dx would be this. This is the positive x direction. This is a negative gradient. It's in the wrong quadrant, right? In this quadrant with x and y, it would be, am I doing that right for you? In this quadrant with y and x, that would be positive gradient. In this quadrant, it's negative. And so that means that this negative gradient, this is negative. Because of this, this is positive, And the flow has to be from your left to your right in this case. And that's how it's getting carried downstream. If it was denser um, than uh, water, then there's no reason for it to stop at the water table. It would go down all the way through to here. And it would then puddle in some way. Again, the water table is sloped this way, so the velocity of the groundwater flow is from your left to your right. And this plume here that develops here is a direct consequence of this smeared zone that's through here. Clearly, it's passed through here, um, and it's left this smear. So a lot of this is still filled with water, maybe 80% water and 20% of this new uh, solvent which is present there. And so now we'd, we'd like to know what the distribution is because it will do a couple of things. It will affect the permeability of this and it will also affect the amount of aerial contact, if you like, between the, um, the solvent and the, the groundwater that's flowing and the rate at which it will dissolve into the groundwater. And so if we look back at this, i uh, pull this out here. These are the kinds of geometries that we might expect to exist here. And that is that somewhere close to maybe 
this front here, for instance. It's not going to be a sharp interface on this boundary. And certainly where it flows over these low permeability or high capillary barrier beds around here, if we looked in detail at that, we might see something that looked a bit like this. And this is actually a bead pack, kind of artificial, but you can see here, hopefully, can you see that? Should I turn the lights off here? Hello? <laughs> Anyone with me? Lights okay? On? Okay, fine. Large grains here, small grains here. This has filled this up here, but stopped at the interface between them. This, this is the boundary between these large and small grains. But you see these little ganglia going here. So what they're doing is they're choosing the pathways that have the most open um, throats for us to be able to move things through. And so this is the, the kind of behavior that we'd like to be able to figure out what's going on. We'd like to know that if we take a representative elemental volume that includes water-saturated parts and also solvent-saturated parts, we could calculate what the average saturation of these two components are, because that would tell us how much stuff is in the ground and how much we have to recover to bring it back to pristine conditions. It turns out that if we want to get, bring it back to pristine conditions, then basically we have to get rid of every single part of this red stuff. Even if you even trace amounts are going to be a, a problem, and so we'd like to know exactly how much we'd have to uh, have to recover. So. So that's our, our, our picture for, for what we're attempting to do. And so we'd like to know exactly what the controls are that get this into the place. And I suppose these are just, uh, I don't need to go through these, but the behavior has things like this fingering that goes ahead of the, um, the, the frontal boundary into the most open regions. Because it takes these open regions, um, which are not really very predictable, because we don't know, we can't see into the subsurface because it's opaque exactly where these uh, high open gapped areas are. So we don't know where the, where this stuff will go. But we do know that they probably exist and that these non-aqueous phase liquids, especially problematic, these dense ones, will choose to take those. And so we, uh, we have to expect that in most cases where that might exist, if we can use other methods to figure out where that is, then we should be able to try and figure out exactly what those, what that distance would be that it would travel and what those saturations might be once it's traveled there. So how far does it go? What controls it? Is it permeability? We've said no. Uh, so what is it, the property that controls that migration? And once they are there in place and able to dissolve and get carried downstream, we'd like to know how quickly do they dissolve what is the impact of a given velocity of fluid water traveling past that system in driving the this, this stuff downstream? So those are the kinds of things that we like to figure out. And to do that, what we'd like to do is understand a little bit about immiscible fluid flow. There's a, I don't think you'll need to access it, but there's a relatively authoritative text on this. Uh, Jacob Baer's book on dynamics of fluids in porous media. Chapter 9 is where this stuff is taken from, uh, but hopefully we'll make a, a decent enough description of it here that you don't have to um, revert to that. So miscible displacement means you have two fluids. They start off as two fluids. They stay as two fluids. There's some dissolution of maybe one fluid into the other one, solvent into water, even though water is a, a solvent. Uh, but the, the concentrations of them in dissolved form are going to be relatively small. Parts per million, parts per billion are typical magnitudes. If you look at traveling downstream, and we'll talk about this, this dissolved component will have dispersion will occur, and uh, perhaps we won't, and that's what this is being shown here, like putting a, a bead of ink in a beaker of water. It doesn't stay as a bead of ink. It diffuses throughout the water over time. And so that is the dissolution and diffusion process that we'll look at when we talk about contaminant transport. But for now, we're not interested in miscible displacement. We're interested only in immiscible displacement. And so that means that the fluids taste separate. They can both move independently of each other at different rates and arrive at different locations. And that the interfacial tension between them 
is something that's important in controlling whether they can move or not. So this issue of capillary pressure, uh, a difference between the pressures in those two fluids, is something that is going to control this behavior. You have certainly seen something about this already, and this little cartoon here is representative of that. The idea of putting a capillary tube into a, a liquid with a, another fluid on top, which is air. If it's water wetting, if it's a, a glass tube, which is essentially quartz, it's water wet and the fluid will rise up along it. And you should be able to tell me exactly what that height rise would be. And a porous medium that we suggested earlier could look like this. Well, perhaps we could draw this porous medium as instead of this, a whole bunch of little capillary tubes. If I emulate this, and this here, a series of three capillary tubes in this particular case, that if we knew what the flow characteristics along those tubes were, we could represent the permeability of the system to give us the correct flow rates through this but also we could represent the entry characteristics. And the entry characteristics really refer to the fact that if we don't get a big enough pressure to push fluid into this tube, then not will it not go very quickly, but it won't go at all. It's a binary process. It either moves or it doesn't move. And so that is the process that we're looking at. And so when we look at these behaviors here in this kind of equilibrium state, then this has been able to move in this little capillary that has connected it to this place. But now it's stopped. And it's stopped because it has no more uh, pressure behind it that is allowing it to move. The forces that are keeping it in place, the meniscus forces, exactly balance the self-weight of the material, the, the negative buoyancy of this material in sinking through the fluid-saturated medium. And so that is the kind of behavior that we're trying to, to, to figure out. So the ground rules in getting there are that we need to know some definitions. We need to know what saturations are defined as. And the saturation you can think of just as the proportion of that particular fluid per unit pore space within the pore's medium. If it was one fluid, water, that's saturating the whole thing, then if you know the volume of the pore space and you completely fill that pore space with that fluid, then the saturation would be one. If there's zero fluid in the pore space, it would be zero. So it ranges between zero and one. But you could also have two fluids in it, and you do actually have two fluids. If you have water and air, then it might be 50% filled with water and 50% filled with air then the saturation of each of those is 0.5 as a decimal. And by definition, they have to sum to 1 because they have to com something has to completely fill the pore space. It could be water, it could be gasoline, and it could be air, as in three phases. But the three proportions of those have to sum to 1 by definition. So that's basically what this statement is here. They have to sum to 1. So saturation is just the volume of a particular fluid, fluid alpha, divided by the total void space, by volume, on a volume basis. In sat unsaturated flow, so this is our engineer's definition. It's our definition of saturation. Soil scientists use a moisture content, which is different. It's moisture content rather than saturation, also volumetric. And it's different because the it's calculated over the total, vo total volume of the sample, not just the void space of the sample. So in other words, if you have a porosity of 20%, if you have a porosity of 50% in the sample, and you completely fill that porosity with water, 50% water fills the total of the voids and the solid, which is one, and so the moisture content of that sample would be 50%, 0.5. But its saturation would be 100%, because it 100% fills the void space. And so we need to make the distinction between a saturation and a volumetric moisture content used by soil scientists, just by definition. We will rarely use this, but we will use it in some cases. And if you're a soil mechanics guy building buildings uh, on foundations, 
then the moisture content for soil mechanics folks, foundation engineers, is on a weight basis. The weight of water in a system divided by the weight of solids. And typically the way that that's measured is you take a sample that's wet, you weigh it, you put it in an oven overnight above 100 degrees centigrade, you boil off the water, you weigh it again. The difference between those two solid weights, two initial weight and dry weights, is the amount of water. And so the weight of water divided by the dry weight is the, the moisture content on a weight basis. And so those are a couple of definitions. We looked at these pictures yesterday, or uh, Tuesday rather. Let's not go through those again. Other than to make the case that, well, this is what we're interested in. We are going to want to know why, in this figure, my computer's working very hard here, I can hear it, that why this fluid has chosen to go on down this particular path here, rather than, for instance, go on this particular path and we could surmise that the gaps between the individual particles of this bead pack are slightly larger on this left-hand route that it's taken this direction rather than this one here. And so that's the operating hypothesis that we'll, we'll work on. And clearly, if we're able to describe this behavior at this scale, it has something for us to be able to say about what's going to happen at a larger scale as to whether, for instance, it will stop before it gets to the water table it will stop as soon as it gets to its first barrier. Or if it's denser than water, it'll hit the water table. And what will actually stop it from keeping on going? That's the, the fundamental question that we're trying to ask. And a subsidiary question would be, if we took a volume, control volume that included this chimney, how much of this Dean apple or Elm apple is sitting in here that we'd have to move? How much is sitting in this lens, how much is sitting floating on the top of the groundwater? Those are the basic questions that we'd like to address. So the mechanics of that are it'll move through the system and reach some equilibrium, and we'd like to know exactly how that occurs. It's clearly going to be related to these interfacial properties that exist within the fluids, and we know that we potentially have at least two fluids because we're talking about multi-phase flow, dual, dual, dual phase flow. And so what we could do is we could look at water and oil in contact, fluid I and fluid J. And the attraction between these is this interfacial tension between them, which is really the, the force that sustained sticking them together, the adhesion, if you like, that's between them. If you pull them apart so they're separate, and you know, just like we've talked in 303, if you want to cavitate a fluid, make it into a, pull it into a vacuum, you will vaporize it uh, by pulling it apart. It's just like cavitation. And so then you get potentially two liquids, I and K, but now separated by vapor between them. I with its own vapor below it, and K with its own vapor above it. And the surface tension between those, by definition, are the tension that the water walking bug on the surface of the lake would be working on. The surface tension would be what would buoy, not buoy, wrong term, would keep that bug's feet from sinking into the water. That is surface tension. Water in contact with water vapor above it, water vapor in the air, in equilibrium. And so Dupre's formula gives us a way, if we measure the work that we have to apply to pull these two fluids apart, if we know what either the surface tension of these two are relative to each other, from measuring this work that we do, we can calculate the interfacial tension between these two fluids. So it's a relationship, but it's not particularly important to us, but it's perhaps important for us to, to broach what the definitions of surface tension a fluid in contact with its own vapor versus interfacial tension, two fluids in contact with each other. Two, did you sign? <laughs> He's gone. Uh, okay. We can all, so the reason for us to be interested in this is that we can look at fluids in porous media, 
and we can also look at fluids in a swimming pool. And it's probably easier for us to talk about fluids in a swimming pool first. So if you take a swimming pool full of water and you put oil on top of it, then if it's gasoline, it will float. And depending on the magnitudes of these interfacial tensions between the liquid and the gas and the liquid and the liquid, then the magnitudes of whether this will spread across that surface or not are controlled by the magnitudes of these interfacial tensions. We can draw a free body diagram if we assume that the shape of this lens would look like this. Probably it would be much shorter aspect ratio, much flatter than that. But if you look at resolving forces, you take the cosines of these angles, then equilibrium requires that this force here has to equal the components of these forces acting in the horizontal directions, which are this and this. And if we ignore the fact that this angle is going to be actually very, very shallow, close to zero, then these go to being one. And we have a relationship here that is an equality. And basically this equality says that if this intrinsic property of the interfacial tensions between these two fluids is larger than the sum of these two, this expression here, then it won't form a separate puddle that exists that, but it will keep on spreading until it reaches the edge of the pool because this is keeping on tugging it out. And so you'll only get a lens if this equality is not met. And if it happens that, which is most of the times, that this interfacial tension is larger than the sum of these two, then you just get a sheen on top of the water which covers it. And we know that from looking at whatever well, different movie, I guess. I'm trying to think what that movie was. It was one of the Lampoon movies. Never mind. Replace the water by a solid. And we're interested in doing that because all of the flow that we have is not dropping Dean Apple into a swimming pool, so it ponds on the bottom but dropping it through a swimming pool that happens to be already filled with sand. And so the substrate that it flows past is going to have the same behavior. So now this is the quartz that's present on the grain of sand. This is the liquid which is on top of it. And we can talk about the same interfacial tensions between the solid and the gas, the solid and the liquid, and the liquid and the gas between these three components. We can do exactly the same um, equality by resolving forces in the horizontal direction and we can say the same thing. We can say the same thing that if this magnitude is larger than some of these in the limit that would completely spread across, across the quartz, across the windshield, if you think you rain on a windshield, and cover it to a, a monomolecular layer thickness across the, the windshield. But if it's not met then it may be that the water can actually bead on the windshield. And if it beads on the windshield, then this angle here isn't necessarily going to be very flat, isn't necessarily going to zero. And so there's one useful behavior that we can get from this, and this is you take a car windshield or you take a microscope slide, you put a drop of oil on it and or water on it, and you look at exactly what the bead looks like. You can take the contact angle of that bead and depending on that contact angle, it says something about the characteristics of the wetting of that surface. If the water sits like this, if the angle theta is less than 90 degrees, like this in other words, then it is water wet. water non wet no wet if it is large if it goes up so that it's 90 degrees then it's neutral and if the bead looks like this so that this angle here theta so no sorry wrong so that this angle here theta is greater than 90 degrees, it's 
non water wetting not vetting but wetting so if the bead wetting water wet yeah non water wetting so it's non water wetting it resists covering over this and so in this particular case you could imagine that if this angle goes to zero it just scoots across the the complete substrate and completely wets it and which is true for most um, sandstones quartz sand materials the case of non water wetting behavior if this number is greater than 90 degrees so the threshold between these not drawing it very well here is for this magnitude here this is 90 degrees this is the boundary between them so these The rationale of that is that here this is the water wetting this is the fluid which is wetting but now the fluid which with the narrow angle which is the wetting fluid is the gas the gas is non-wetting the liquid water is the wetting fluid okay. sorry All right. okay so the the implications of that are that if you have a capillary that you put into water then, so in other words, if you take a, a capri tube and you drop it into water, then you know that if it's water wetting, then the meniscus will rise and it will rise to some critical height, which we'll call H sub C, and that this angle here will be less than 90 degrees. This is our theta. And that's exactly what this case is a water wet substrate quartz or glass water rises up the tube and the water is a wetting fluid the air is a non-wetting fluid if you look at something like mercury as a fluid so this is the same glass capillary and if you look at what the meniscus would look like it'll look like this it'll be depressed by this amount which is h sub c and the contact angle, if I just extend the two, will look like this. In other words, like this. And so you can think of two different liquids in the same tube. They have different behaviors. One is water wetting. One, one liquid wets the substrate, and one liquid non-wets the substrate. And so that's true if this was water and this was mercury. Or you could think about it as being water and quartz in this case and water and shale or clay minerals or carbonate minerals in this case so this could be either a quartz wall and water which is this that tan one or a quartz wall and mercury which would be these two so if you keep the same tube but change the fluids that would be that behavior if you keep the same fluids then this again would be quartz but this would be something like um, shale or carbonate limestone say and so it depends on the liquid and it depends on the medium which is going through so it seems kind of complicated, but in most cases, what we'll deal with are systems that are water wet. And so it'll be this one here on the left. Yes? Well, doesn't that depend on like, the weathering? It could be. It depends. It could mean what grains are left still. Carbonates, uh, or sorry, limestones are mainly in calcium carbonate, and it's only a single material. If it weathers to something else, and that mineral has a different material behavior, then it will be different. So, yeah. So. Weathering would just, if weathering replaces the material to be some other material that has a different wetting characteristic, 
then yes, the book. That's, that's a logical progression of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's the background that we need for this. This narrative here revolves around, so these are some figures. I'm going to come back to the, the narrative that's here, but this explains better what I want to, to say here. So ultimately, we're going to say something about using capillary models to describe what's going on. But it's perhaps easier to take a cross section through one of these bead packs and to think about what the wetting and saturation characteristics are of those bead packs. This is a figure that comes out of that uh, chapter 9 uh, book by Baer, uh, Dynamics of Flow in Porce Media. And since most of the literature that developed from this came from the petroleum industry from the you know, 1920s onwards, the idea of a water wet fan with two fluids in it, and if I just zoom out here, you see the two fluids. Black is oil, white is water, or, or, and the stippled portions of the grains. So initially, in the subsurface, if you have an oil reservoir, you'd like it to have lots of oil in it, most of the pore space being filled with oil, but not all of it. So it has some proportion of water. The percentages might be 80% saturated with oil, 20% saturated with water. If you recover this by sucking out the oil, you can't just suck it out without replacing it with something. So typically you think about re recovering something from petroleum reservoirs by kind of sucking, but you know that if you suck something out of a well, water will cavitate with only 24 feet of head. Try and suck it up more than 24 feet and it will become a vapor. And so typically what you do is you push in another brine that pushes it through the formation and out of your well. And so you replace it by putting more water in the system. So you go from this in the reservoir, you pump more water into it, it looks like this. And then ultimately it looks like this as you keep on progressing in time. So going down through here is progressing in time. The behaviors that you see here are described, and we'll concentrate on this left-hand one, a different kind of saturation. And the first kind of saturation is referred, so, so you start off here with water in the system. The water in this particular system is present because these grains are water wet. The water is present as a, a single molecule of water on the surfaces of all of these grains and that will stay there and also a little bit that exists in these uh, pendular rings as they're called and these pendular rings um, are a torus that if you imagine two grains that are in contact with each other that have some water that is held in this contact between them, then it's like a donut that goes around these two contacts. And so these pendular rings are where the water is. The water is fully connected through the system, but only on the surface of the grains. And so if you suck fluid out of here, the water is not connected to each other. This, is, this little ring here, this donut, is completely isolated here from this donut here, and therefore when you suck over here, none of the water moves. So that's great if you're trying to produce the reservoir or pull the napple out of the ground because you'll only pull this black fluid out, which is what you want to get out if you're remediating it. And so if you pull it out, you have to replace it with something. You could replace it with other oil if there's oil upstream, or you could be pushing it out with water from upstream. It'll go to look like this. So these pendular rings will grow and they'll become larger, as you see here. And as they keep on growing, they'll start to fill up the pore space. And this little blob, this bubble, if you like, of oil will sit in here. And now you've changed from a system where the oil is connected as you go from one side to the other and you pull out oil. Now in this system, only the water is connected from one side to the other. And so if you push water or if you suck water or if you suck whatever the fluid is here, these will get left in here. You can't get them out. They're just bubbling around inside this little pore space and they won't go out. And so that, in oil, 
reservoir engineering is a bad thing because maybe you suck stuff out and you leave 20%, 30% of the oil in situ and you don't have that as a resource that's recovered. And that's kind of a bad thing because it costs you because you're not making profit on that. In groundwater remediation, this is really bad because you're leaving stuff in, maybe it's 20%, but that 20% will dissolve into the water and then every measure, every pore volume of water that gets pushed through this will dissolve the same amount of stuff, maybe at parts per million, maybe at parts per billion, but all of a sudden, everything that comes through here is not going to be drinking water quality anymore. And so you can't actually consider that if you get to this final stage, you're done. And so, so that's an important realization to understand in this. And so if you go back to these definitions here, uh, just to, to put the narrative there, we start off on the top figure with these so-called pendular rings, donuts or toruses around the contact between drains. The water phase between upstream and downstream is not continuous, but the oil phase is. And so if you pump, you only get oil out. And the only water, even though it coats all the grains and kind of is in contact between upstream and downstream on the grain surfaces, pumping it out because of meniscus effects won't move any water. As you go to the second diagram, by pumping water in, you increase the wetting phase saturation. There's more water in the system. At some stage, the water becomes continuous between upstream and downstream, left and right, and that you'll remove water, and you'll keep on changing it. And then this critical saturation is this so-called funicular saturation. And I, actually, I, I was going to say, this uh, in the news right now, you can't get into Zermatt, the Swiss ski resort, because there's too much snow in Europe. I think the, the train that takes you in there goes through a tunnel and doesn't go up a mountain. But a funicular railway is one of these cog railways that gets carried by the, the motion of the cog. So funicular saturation means exactly that. To get this blob of water, of oil, sorry, out through the system, you have to put it on a conveyor belt. The water has to carry it out through the system. And it turns out that getting it through this very narrow pore throat by just pulling it by the, the viscous friction of the water on the oil droplet is not enough to move it. It's always going to stay in here. And so this funicular saturation at this low level is always going to be left. So, so those three phases are something for us to understand. If conversely the sand was oil wet, then you just switch these individual components for each other. Now it's a mono layer of oil on the uh, particles. The water fills the void space. You push in more oil, and it starts to replace the, the water that was present there until you get a funicular saturation of the water, in which case you can't get the final water out of the system. And these conditions where we end up with 20% of water or 20% of the napple in the system at the end, end behaviors are something that we'll see when we talk about capillary pressure versus saturation curves. Not today, but this leads directly into that. Okay? I see your attention is wrapped with this. I see you're very engaged in this. I think you are, actually. Some people are looking at you, too. <laughs> Some of you are looking at this. We uh, talked about this in um, 303, height rise in a capillary. Um, and the same principle applies if we think about a porous medium with the pore spaces within that porous medium being individual capillary tubes, these pathways that this fluid would have taken. For instance, we could think of this pathway that we have here as being a capillary tube. So I suppose if we wanted to, very rudimentarily, we could think about this being some kind of capillary tube that goes through the gaps between these individual particles. It's not quite that simple, right? Because the spaces isn't going to be, it's not physically going to look like a tube, but the widest part of the tube will be the open volumes within the pore space, and the narrowest part of the tube will be the, the, the tightest constrictions because of the arrangements of the marbles in the bead pack. But if we do think of it as a tube, then we could think of it just as a capillary tube that's put into water. And if it's a water-wet capillary tube, then the behavior will look like this. And what we'd like to know is what is this height rise, H sub C, that defines this behavior. 
And the reason for wanting to know this is that you can think of this pressure head. This is a height of water, but a height of water divided by a unit weight of, um, sorry, a height of water multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid would give us a pressure. And you can think of that as a pressure that you have to apply here to physically push this thing down so it moves to the equilibrium location at the bottom. And in the same way that we're trying to calculate what the fluid pressure is that we have to apply to displace this through the system, we could also think of it as the fluid pressure that gets applied by the self-weight of this stuff that physically drags it down through the porous medium. But that's kind of the, our thoughts here. And so this is the proxy value that we'd use. And we know a couple of things. We know that, I'm going to switch to red because I like red, as you know. We know that the pressures in a fluid are constant in all directions. And so we also know that if there's no gradient in here, then the pressure acting on here is exactly the same pressure here. That means that we can cut this thing off and pull it up by its bootstraps. And if we do that, then the pressure that's acting on this surface has to be atmospheric pressure, which is the same as the atmospheric pressures acting here. And so we can do a free body diagram that calculates how much force we have to apply on this circumference, on this tube, which is of height h sub c. And the weight of this, which is pulling down. And so the force that's applied that's pulling this up is only on the circumference, in other words, where this liquid meets the contour of the glass capillary. It might be at an angle, in which case we have to take the component of that force in the vertical direction because it's pulling it up. And we can just do a free body diagram. And what's that free body diagram? Pi D is the area of this. Um, no, it's not, is it? Just backing out. HC pi d squared upon 4 is the area. Of this. Sorry, this is the area. This is the volume. The volume multiplied by the unit weight is the weight that's pulling down. And that is countered by the circumference, which is this, pi d, the length around here multiplied by the interfacial tension, the, con the tension between the water and the quartz that's on here. And I guess it would also have a magnitude which is cosine theta. And if it's parallel to that, then this value is, is zero, and this is just one. And so if we rearrange that in terms of things we know, we know this is a fluid property between the water and the quartz glass. We know the unit weight of the water, and we know the diameter of the capillary, and we can calculate exactly what the height is that it's drawn, drawn up. So we can calculate what that height rise would be. We know that if we make the capillary smaller, then it will rise higher. Uh, and if we change the interfacial tension of the fluid to be larger, it will also rise higher. So that's the, the functional relationship we have. So this is the height rise that we have here. If we look at the magnitude of a head is equal to an elevation plus a pressure divided by a unit weight, then this magnitude here, we could think about taking this head h sub c and we multiply it by unit weight and this is equal to a pressure, a fluid pressure. 
And so what we can think about this is that this HC, we can think of it as a difference between two pressures. And the two pressures are the pressures that if you look at this meniscus, it's got a curve in it. And so we know that it's able to contain a pressure within that curve, curvature. And the pressure within the water and the pressure in the non-wetting fluid, which in this case is the gas, are different from each other. And this difference in pressures is what we will refer to as the capillary pressure, always given as the difference between the non-wetting pressure, fluid pressure minus the wetting pressure, just by convention. And this is actually the same as this value, H sub C, multiplied by unit weight. Physically, that's what it is. You can think of it that it's the excess pressure that you have to apply somewhere along a capillary tube that has a bead of something in it. The excess pressure you have to apply between the upstream and the downstream to physically push it along that capillary tube. And if you apply that pressure larger than that, it will go and it will keep on going forever as long as your tube is long. If the pressure is less than that, it won't move at all. The velocity will be zero. It will be just static. So again, it's a, a binary behavior. So that's the reason that we talk about capillary uh, height rises or capillary heights, which are capillary pressures. And we can use that to say something about the characteristics of these media. So if the height rise is high, since this is proportional to the capillary pressure, then a high magnitude of this means a high capillary pressure. It means you have to apply a lot of pressure to be able to push it through the system. And that will occur if we have a high interfacial tension or if we have a very small pore diameter. And so it's saying that if you have a gravel which has really big pores in it, the stuff will go through it really easily. You don't have to have a very high self-weight gradient to push it through it. But if you have a clay or a shale, which has very tight pores, maybe nano, nanometer scale pores, then you have to have a really very, very big column of this stuff with enough pressure to be able to push it through the system. And now we can say something about how big that pressure should be if we know exactly what the diameter of those pores would be. And that's kind of one of the, the fundamental behaviors that we, we might be interested in looking at. So that's one model that we could apply to this. A porous medium, a bead pack. Imagine trying to fit all these little capri tubes that go through this bead pack that just go through the pore volume and don't touch the solid grains. The other, the other thing that this doesn't tell us anything about is what the saturations would be. We said before that we're interested to know whether it's 80% uh, oil saturated or 20% oil saturated. And how would we use this knowledge about capillary pressures to be able to say something about this? Indeed, is there a relationship between this capillary pressure magnitude and the saturation that we'd expect to find? There is, and we're not quite ready to go there yet. But just to make the point that in these bead packs, there's also another model that we could apply to describe exactly what the physical behavior is. And this model could be something that looks like this a grain and another grain. They're actually in contact. But this other wetting fluid, which is stuck between them, which in this case is much higher saturation than this, it's kind of filled up all of this region here. But initially, if it comes in through here, it might first of all look like this, and it gets in between here, and it comes out the other side, and you can imagine as it, there's just enough to fill up this space, it would look like this before it started going up and filling this region. So another model we could have would be grain on grain and look at the interface between the other fluid on top of these grains. And if we do that, that is a complementary model maybe, but a different one. And this is the idea. And so you could think about two grains that are together. Uh, between those grains, we have water, a wetting fluid, which is the black here. And you can probably imagine, you know, it's the difference between you know, a sand. If you have two grains of sand and you have a meniscus, you can probably 
drop the bottom grain, and it'll still stuck there because it's held by interfacial tension. Interfacial tension that keeps the water on the grain, but by virtue of the fact that it's also linked to the other grain, it would also keep these things anchored together. And so what we could do is we could look at the same kind of equilibrium analysis that we did for the capillary tube and how much the fluid would rise in this different configuration. And in the same way that when we looked at this capillary rise here, we said that this interface between these fluids, the pressure across this boundary is different uh, because interfacial tension is allowing this to be different because it's holding it in place. It's the same as a balloon. You inflate a balloon, the pressure inside the balloon is larger than outside, and it's because the interfacial tension, the tension in the rubber in the balloon, is holding it in place. This is no different from that. In this case, a lower, a higher pressure here than in this, which is in tension. Higher pressure in the gas, lower pressure in the um, water. And so you can think of this as a balloon, and because of this curvature, as this curvature gets more extreme, the pressure differential between them becomes more extreme as well, you could imagine. Yes. So here, we can do that analysis. And it turns out we won't derive it, but the pressure difference between the gas here and the water here is given by this, which is given by the interfacial tension of water on quartz, multiplied by the two reciprocals of the radius of curvature. And the radius of curvature you have here are two, right? Grain on grain, there's a radius of curvature that goes around it, circular, but there's also this scalloped curvature that is pleasant in this, this dimension here. So there's one radius of curvature here, which is R prime. If you look, but there's also another radius of curvature if you're looking down in this direction, you'd see that this was a circle which is here. And so that would be a radius, which would this would be R prime prime, which is this here. And without deriving it, it doesn't matter, then we can calculate exactly what this pressure differential which is being held here, it's just um, this magnitude here. And if we know what these radius of curvature are, we can calculate what this pressure differential is. So you can see that if there's only a little bit of water here, you could imagine that the uh, curvature is quite small. If the curvature is quite small, then this is a big number, and the pressure differential is large. As the curvature gets, radius of curvature gets larger, the pressure gets smaller, and if it becomes something that would fill this in here, this would have an infinite curvature. I guess this would go to infinity. This term would be zero but you'd still be left with this term around the, the donut, per se. And so that's what we need to understand about interfacial tension. So two different models. A capillary with the blob in it. If we're trying to blow, blow the uh, bead out, the pressure we have to apply is the capillary pressure that has to overcome this. I'm not sure what the ana analogy would be here, but the kind of analogy is that you have two grains. They're welded together by this water. Depending on the density of this, I suppose, if you start off with a very small amount of water, these might be stuck together. If you increase the saturation or the amount of water in here, then this uh, adhesion force would reduce and they may drop from each other. So the other part that's interesting here is that we've talked about these kind of isolated components. A capillary tube, which is one component of a whole bundle of capillaries that make up the behavior of the porous medium, or two grains, grain on grain, which make up a whole bead pack of those grains. What we want to know not is really what the behavior is at a single contact or a single bead within the uh, capillary tube, but overall its behavior and its overall saturation within the bead pack. And so these are useful models to get us to that first place, but they're not really sufficient to get us the whole way there. And the reason for that is it matters what the structure of the porous medium is. And so you can do a thought exercise. And the thought exercise would be to take a small capillary and a big capillary, tiny capillary and a big capillary. Both, dip them both in water. You know the little capillary 
the pressure is the fluid is going to rise high I guess this one the big fat one it's going to be almost nothing and so the pressures that you'd have to apply in each of these to move it in the big capillary would be almost nothing and to move it in the little capillary you're going to have to really blow hard to push it through and so if you think of a structural medium with these two capillaries fat and thin instead of being in water being the porous medium that you're trying to push stuff through like this whoops not that but like this is that fluid will go really easily through the big one but it'll get hung up in the little one and so if this is what it looks like in the subsurface then it's always going to be happy to go through here and it will always get from upstream to downstream irrespective of whether you're flowing it horizontally or whether you're spilling a drum full of uh, TCE on the surface, which is going down, trying to go down through the little one, can't make it, can go through the big one, and it'll just keep on going, and it'll keep on all going through the big one. If the porous medium doesn't look like these parallel flow regimes, but these kind of series, a little capillary, a big fat capillary, a little capillary, big fat capillary, etc., like this, if you turn it on its side, then this is intrinsically much better, right? It'll go in here, even if it gets past the big fat one, it'll get hung up on the little one. And so this will have intrinsically a different behavior in terms of whether you can get it in the subsurface or not. And these are just kind of thought exercises, but it's important to be able to think about this in terms of thinking about what rocks and soils might look like. So if you have a soil that has a whole bunch of fractures in it, which are quite wide, and accept this stuff and act as big capillaries, then you have much more risk of it going deep into the subsurface and getting to the groundwater table and contaminating the groundwater and being a source as it moves off to some compliance point than if it's all homogeneous, fine-grained clay or shale with no fractures in it. And so that's one kind of fundamental, practical consequence, I guess, of, that comes out of what we've talked about today. And so we've talked about these two different capri models, a capri tube that represents behavior and grain on grain, which both represent some components of what a real porous medium would look like. But if we think that the really dangerous parts in the subsurface might be individual fractures, the same fractures that you see when you're driving up uh, into town on 322 and you come past these nice lime limestone exposures if you're driving at the right time, you'll see the GSI students. You might have been out there on the G-Science, uh, on 452. Do you take a field trip these days still? No field trip? <coughs> Terrible. GSI 1. GSI 1. So you do something. Yeah. So you know what fractures look like in rock. Fluids can go along there quite happily. So does everyone take GSI 1? So instead of a capri tube or grain on grain, another possible geometry would be a parallel plate, two parallel plates together with fluid in between them. Take these parallel plates, dip them into water, and you have exactly this geometry here. You can do exactly the same calculation that we did for the capri tube by isolating off this volume here. This is this height. So you end up with something that looks... If I can draw it properly, I don't know why my this is so skittish on me. It's giving me a time delay. Must be getting tired. Me too. Then this is H sub C. This is the aperture of the fracture. And so, and this is the width into the page. Yes, it's getting very temperamental. Then W is equal to the volume times unit weight. The volume is equal to H sub C times B times W. Very simply, right? Just the volume of this. And the force that's being applied is just along this contour, these two contours. And so if you look at these two components here, this is the volume, this is the unit weight. And so together, this term here 
sad day when it can't think as fast as I can. W. And this is the length over which this is applied, W. On two sides of the fracture, interfacial tension and any angle that it makes with the, uh, the side. When did we finish this class? Five minutes, yeah, thanks. And so if we do that, we end up with a functional relationship which is the same as before, similar before. The height rise is proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the unit weight and the aperture. I guess we're going to have to stop soon. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Not yet. And that relates to capri pressure. And so that's kind of the story of what we're attempting to do. So today, if we look back on what we've done, we've talked about three, cat three models. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> One is a tube, which represents the pore spaces. One which represents grain on grain, which represents the, the joining between grains in the porous medium. And one which represents perhaps the most important geometry, geometric feature, which is a fracture. And we have capillary relationships for all of those. It turns out that that's good in terms of looking at the dependencies of how this affects behavior. But really what we'd like to know is we'd like to know something about how we can define how this saturation, we've only looked at the cases where it's 100% saturated with the stuff in it or 0% saturated. We'd like to know something about these spectrum, if you like, of saturations and what the appropriate pressures would be that we'd have to apply to push stuff in under those cases. And so what we'll do is we'll look now at real porous media and try and define exactly what those entry pressures should be and how saturations will change with those pressures. And that is it.